Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 17. This is a story that many of you know as the rich young ruler. If you've heard about him. And uh, in verse 17, it says, Jesus, he was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, and a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all of these commandments since I was young. In other words, he said, Jesus, what you said, I just, I've done everything. That's kind of a bold statement to tell Jesus. He said, I haven't missed it at all. I've done everything. And Jesus said, well, there's one thing you still haven't done. I want you to go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. And he said, you'll have treasure in heaven. And then I want you to come and I want you to follow me. At this, the man's face fell and the, he went away sad for he had many possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of times when people uh, mention this passage of scripture, they stop right there. And they turn around and say, see, God doesn't want you to have money. He doesn't want you to have stuff. He wants you to be humble and po. But if you read the rest of the conversation here with Jesus, it's actually the opposite. And it's interesting because most of the time when people would come to Jesus, you know, he'd minister to them, talk to them, and then they'd want to follow him, and he'd say, go away, you know, go back home, go share, you know, with your friends, family. Here's a guy that Jesus is actually recruiting. He said, I want you to come and follow me. I want you to be part of my crew, part of my posse. And he, and he said, I just need you to do one thing. I want you to, to go and, and sell what you have and give it away. And people would say, see, Jesus don't want you having money. Jesus is poor, so you need to be poor. Well, neither one of it's true because Jesus goes on and says, Dear, dear children, it's very hard for them to enter into the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And notice it says the disciples, they were astounded. It says right before that, they were amazed at what Jesus said. And, and they were taken back and they said, how can anybody be saved? Now think about this. Would a poor person be saying that? No. The disciples, these, many of these guys, these were business guys. Remember when Jesus told Peter, he said, I want you to launch out into the deep and cast out your net. And, and, and Peter didn't fully obey, and he put out one net, his old net, and the net broke. And it was filling up so fast, it says he had to go and call his partners. He had his business partners come in with their boats, and they start filling things up. Uh, you had some guys that, that uh, were tax collectors that were part of Jesus' crew. Well, these tax collectors weren't poor people. They were very well off. And Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And it says the disciples, they were amazed. And they were astounded and said, then how can anybody be saved? And these are guys that were following Jesus all the time. So, so the reason they're asking this is because they had some money. And Jesus goes on and says, humanly speaking, it's impossible, but not with God. For everything is possible with God. Verse 28 says, Peter spoke up and said, but Jesus, we've given up everything to follow you. And Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the gospel will receive when? Now in this time, in this life, will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fathers, property, along with persecution and in the world to come. That person will have eternal life. Now, if you listen to people talk about this, they'll say, see, Jesus was telling the guy to go and, and give away of all his stuff. That way, when he dies and gets to heaven, he'll have stuff. Well, you don't, number one, you don't need the stuff when you get to heaven. You need the stuff here. And if, you're just, if, you, if you just use a little bit of smarts and you read the rest of what Jesus said, what he was getting at was, dude, your, your, your money has your heart. And if you'll let go of that, I'll actually get you more. He said, if you'll go and give it away, come follow me. And then he's telling Peter and the rest of the guys, hey, you know what? You've given up a lot, but, but you didn't give it up and, and not getting anything in return. You're going to receive a hundredfold return now in this life. And then when you get to heaven, you'll experience eternal life. So it's not a, a, a give it all away so you can have eternal life. No, it's give it all away so you can experience some life now and experience and enjoy the stuff now. 
And then when you get to heaven, things get even a little bit better. But you need the stuff here. You need the money here, don't you? How are you going to pay your bills? You can't do it just on faith alone. Anybody ever gone down to the bank to pay a bill and said, I'm just going to faith it? Or you write out a hot check and you don't call it hot. You say faith. It's a faith check. And they say, what do you mean? It means the money ain't there, but I'm believing for it. Believe with me. Here you go. <laughs> now you got to look at you like you're a fool and you just got through smoking something. They ain't going to take that, right? You, you can't work that way because it takes money. It takes stuff. And so you have to have that. And Jesus understood that. The Bible tells us that Jesus, he had financial partners that gave unto him. And he had a treasurer and all these type of things. But in, the, in this passage of Scripture, it, you see Jesus, he says, go and give what you have so you can have treasure in heaven. Also notice Jesus doesn't say, so you can have treasure in heaven and when you die, you can enjoy it. No, once you, you get into this thing about sowing and reaping and see what Paul says, especially over in Galatians and, and over in 2 Corinthians, you find out that that treasure that's being stored up, you can actually withdraw from it right now. And you can access it right now and is it interesting you know you remember the story about Zacchaeus Zacchaeus was a wee little man a wee little man was he uh, yeah, yeah so Zacchaeus you know isn't it interesting when Jesus talking to Zacchaeus he was a tax collector he was a greedy little fool and he was taking everybody's money and when he when he repented and, and turned his life over to the Lord notice Zacchaeus said I'm gonna go and I'm gonna give half and notice Jesus doesn't turn around and say, you bad, bad man, you got to give all of it away. See, it wasn't about the amount, it was about the what? It was about the heart. It was about the heart. And you see this even more if you turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. This one's always interesting because people read this and they, they think it doesn't apply to them. But 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, command those who are rich in this present age, this world that we live in, Command those that are rich in this present age not to do what? Not to trust in uncertain riches, but to trust in God who gives what? Who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So he's not telling us that God doesn't want you to have stuff. He's saying God gives us the stuff, but he wants your trust to be in him. So you can have the stuff as long as the stuff doesn't have you. And he said, command those who are rich in this age. And a lot of Christians today read that and say, oh, that ain't me. I ain't rich. Yes, you are. You go travel around this world, you'll find out you are very rich. That people in America, hey, uh, us folks, it doesn't matter if you're the, the billionaires or the millionaires. Uh, the, the common everyday Joe Blow in America is in like the top 1% of the, the wealth of the world. We are very, very blessed in this country. And he said, command those who, the, those who are rich. So when you read that, you ought to say, that's me. Actually, it do you good. Say, so command those who are rich. Oh, wait, that's me. He's talking to me. I better, I better wake up and pay attention. He's talking to me. He said, don't trust in the uncertain riches or the money, but trust in who? God, who's giving me the stuff. He's giving me the money. He's giving me, and notice that word, things to enjoy. So in other words, God wants you to have fun in life. There's nothing wrong with having stuff. There's nothing wrong with having things. And when God blesses you with things, don't you dare be ashamed of those things. Now, we don't get arrogant and, and haughty and conceited about it. But, hey, we're, we're grateful for it. And you shouldn't worry about having to hide that from somebody and somebody criticizing you and condemning you because your, your car is too nice or your house is too nice or the things you have are too nice. If you have little red bottom shoes, I could care what color shoes are, bottom my shoes, but, you know, I guess y'all girls do. But, but you shouldn't worry about any of that stuff. The Bible says God gives us richly all things to enjoy. So we ought to be enjoying life and enjoying stuff. But as long as the stuff doesn't have your heart, it doesn't have your heart. Now flip over uh, to Matthew chapter 6. A lot of you have read this over in Matthew chapter 6. I bet you most of you know Matthew 6.33. It says, seek first the kingdom of God. You know? But look, at what we're going to start here in verse 21. And Jesus makes this statement, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21. He says, where your treasure is, that's where what? That's where your heart is. That's where your heart is. Uh, Y'all remember uh, Billy Graham? Billy Graham made this statement one time. He said, he said, if you show me your bank account, I can show you where your heart is. You, you, you pull out your bank statements, I can show you where your heart is. 
Some of us, we find out our heart is in fishing rods. Some of our heart is in red bottom shoes. <clears throat> some, of our, some of our heart is in cars. Some of our heart is in clothes. Some of our heart is in animals. <clears throat> You know, you can find out where your heart is by just following the money trail. You follow the money trail, and you can find out what it is that you love. You can find out what it is that you love. But Jesus said where your, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And then if you go down to verse 24, he makes this statement. He said, uh, no man can serve two masters. He said, no man can serve two masters. Either you're going to hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one. Interesting word. He said, you'll be devoted to the one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But notice Jesus doesn't say you can't serve God and have money. Right? We saw that in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and 17. He said, you can have money, you can have things, just don't trust in them. Don't, don't let those things have your heart. And Jesus said, you, you, can, you can only serve one. In other words, your heart can only be devoted to one. And it's interesting that he uses the word devoted. He said you can only be devoted to one of them. And he's tying in your devotion with what? Money, 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 money. He's tying in devotion with your money. Your devotion to something with your money to something. So he said where your treasure is, your heart is. You can't serve both. You can only serve one. Yet you can still have both. So it's not about the stuff, it's not about the things, it's not about the money, it's about what? It's about your heart. Okay, um, my name is Jeannie Davis. Um, I was born with um, hip dysplasia. I had one leg longer than the other. Um, when I was 50 years old, I got a new hip and they asked if I could have my, if I wanted my legs evened at um, Dartmouth. And um, I said, sure, we wouldn't want their legs even. So, um, I didn't know about Jesus in me. <laughs> Anyways, um, so I had the operation, and they were even. I moved to Tennessee, and I was in Tennessee when I hurt my shoulder. Uh -huh. And um, the physical therapist said, um, you're limping. And I said, I'm not limping. I just had my legs even. Yeah. And she said, well, it's growing again. So um, that's how I ended up with one leg longer. So you came into church tonight with those on. Right. So let's see those shoes. Let's see the difference in shoes. Yep. This is the difference between them. These are made by Grace Company in Dyersburg. Okay. And they were prescription. Yeah. And so what happened? What happened tonight? Yeah. Well, um, I just, uh, I guess I concentrated on Jesus and me. And, um, and your leg just, grew out. My leg grew. <laughs> I didn't even know it could do that. Yeah. So, um, and all the pain went away in your back? Yeah, my pain, in, well, first I noticed my arthritis in my hands, and that no longer seemed to be an issue. Uh -huh. And I, then I realized I didn't have any arthritis in anything. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, that miracles do happen. Yes, ma'am. The thing was that here's a sports agent, and here's the athlete. And, and, the, and the sports agent's trying to hang on to the athlete. He's trying to make sure he's going to be his agent. And the one thing that comes down is that Jerry Maguire, he keeps telling him all these promises, all the things I'm going to do for you, I'm going to do this and do that. But it's interesting that ultimately when it came down for the athlete, the one thing that was going to show him the devotion was you show me the money. Show me the money. And it's actually interesting because when you start reading through Scripture, and you look at God's attitude concerning things, it actually really comes down to that. Because there's a lot of Christians saying, God, I love you. I'll serve you. I'm devoted to you. And God's saying, that's great. Show me the money. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I give you all the days of my life. I, you're the King of kings and Lord of lords. I'll worship you and I'll serve you all my days. That's great, son, but show me the money. Show me the money. And, you know, it's interesting. You listen to people and say, God doesn't want your money. He just wants your heart. You know what? He does want your heart, but he can't have your heart without your money. People saying, Lord, I give you my heart, give you my soul, live for you alone. Good. That's good. Show me the money. Because you show me the money, and that's going to show me your, your heart. Jesus said where your, where your treasure is, that's where your, 
That's where your heart is. Uh, any of you that's, that, that's gotten married here in this house, and, and you remember that, you know, when that person came up and that, that, that good-looking dude, you know, used to be all buff back then, he came up and he proposed to you, and he got down on his knee and he said, baby, I love you. You're the sexiest, hottest thing I've ever seen. I'm so blessed to be able to have you in my life. You're my good thing, my God thing, my heaven thing. I love you, and I, I'm going to be devoted to you all the days of my life. I want you to marry me. And while you're seeing these, saying these sweet little words, and she's crying and this and that. And then you notice you get down on your, on your knees, and you grab her hand. And at that point, it doesn't really matter what you said. You better show her the ring. Right? She's going to be looking down expecting you to put something on And it better not be a lifesaver. It better not come out a little, little quarter thing. She's going to be looking for that ring. Why? Because that ring is ultimately going to symbolize your devotion to your commitment to her. Because at some point, words mean nothing. It's true. Isn't it interesting that you read through the Bible? And, 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 and you're going to be hard-pressed to find a place where God says, I love you. But you are going to find where God so loved you that he, that he gave. See, words are cheap. Anybody can say, I love you. But it's going to take some substance to show you that I love you. See, if you truly love something, your money is going to go to it. If you truly honor something, your money is going to go to it. If you're too, truly uh, gr gracious and thankful for, for who that person is or, or what's been done for you, you're going to show some, you're going to put some resources behind that. Aren't you, are you not? Come on, when, when it comes to people in your, your family and, and your close ones and your close friends, people you love, I mean, it's one thing to say I love you. It's one thing to say that you're my bestie. It's one thing to say that, you know, we're, we're pals and, and I appreciate you and, and I love you, but it's another thing to show them. Is it Right? And so you go through the scriptures and you go through uh, all the statements that Jesus made and God made, and you're going to be hard-pressed to find where God said, I love you. You think about that. God is love. I mean, he's the greatest lover of all time. He is love, and yet he didn't just say it. He did something about it. He did what? From his love, he gave. You know, it's been said many, many times over many years that, you know, you can, you can, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving why because giving is a natural byproduct of your love or you could say a natural byproduct of your heart so you can see the reverse that if you want to find out what somebody truly loves what their devotion truly is you follow the money trail and that's why you, you'll see jesus when the the rich young ruler says hey i want to serve you i want to follow you and what did jesus say show me the money why because the money had his heart and the sad thing is if the dude would have showed the money more than likely it was going to be a setup for him to end up taking judas's place you think about that all those people that came to jesus said i want to follow you and he said no go back to your city go back to your village go back to your family you know go spread the good news and here's a guy jesus said i want you to come and join my team and and he said no because of some dollar bills and missed out on, on who knows what kind of reward. And then Jesus turns around to the disciples and said, you know what? If you'll show me the money, I'll show you even more. You'll get a hundredfold right here in this time because of what you gave. See, once, once, you, once God truly gets your heart, the sky is the limit. You can have anything. Why? Because you, got, you dealt with the money issue. You got the money problem out of the way. And see, friends, this right here, is why money is such a big issue in churches and a lot of people don't like to talk about it a lot of ministers don't like to talk about it because because people start getting tight-fisted and they start getting hard-hearted and the reason is because the devil doesn't like it either because if the devil can get you offended about money offended about tithing offended about giving he's got you and yet it's interesting that there's more promises in the word of god concerning finances than there are concerning healing than there is about prayer that than there is about uh, marriage and, and family and parent. There's more promises in the Bible about money than any other subject. Why? Because money is a big deal. How many of you get up, and you get up early in the morning, and you go and you work all day, 
and you come home and you rest and then you get up and you do it the next day and the next day and you've been doing it for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years and, and, and this is your life and you're doing it for what? Money. Why? Because money is a big deal. It takes money to do stuff, buy stuff. You know, it takes money to, to have stuff. Money is a big deal in our society. And that's why you see that money is actually a big deal with God. Because if he, if he can get your money, then he can have you. And once he's got you, he can do anything through you. He can do anything through you. So people sit there and say, I love God. But actually, we can find out real quick, how's the money? Is your money supporting God, supporting the things of God? Because if it's not, then we've got to truly, truly, truly ask, do you really love him? Because if you really loved him, you'd give toward him. Just like he did for you. So, I know it got quiet here. So, turn over First Chronicles, chapter 29. And I want you to look at King David. You remember David, you know, he killed Goliath. And Dave, we saw several weeks ago, David, he started out, you know, as kind of a poor guy. And then he turned out into a magnificently rich guy. And in First Chronicles chapter 29, David, he's, he's collecting uh, money and materials for this temple that they're going to build. And we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, and we saw the, the massive amount of money and things and materials that came in to build this temple. And in First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 2, it says that David, he prepared his offering with all his might. And in verse 3, David says this. He says, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, notice the result. Because I set my affection on the house of God, or my, my heart on the house of God, my devotion on the house of God, I have done what? I have given to the house of God. Notice again the connection between heart and money. Between heart and money. And as we saw, you know, you go through it and you read and you find out. You're, some of you remember how much David gave of his own personal wealth? $1.5 billion that David gave of his own personal wealth toward the building of the temple. And then his mighty men who he had brought up with him, they put their stuff together, and together they gave $2.5 billion toward building of the temple. And, and it's interesting because David said, because I put my affection on this, because I put my heart on this, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to give to it. I'm going to give to it. And so ultimately that's what it comes down to, to, to things for us is that if we truly love God, we say we love God, we're going to serve God. You know, people will say, well, I love God, so, so I volunteer and, and I serve at my church. That's great. But you know what? Ultimately, it's not about your service. It's about your, it's about the money. It's about the money. Why? Because money is a big deal. Have you ever, have you ever noticed that, that you don't see a lot of people uh, struggling with the temptation to give? Think about it. I, I not, not once in our almost 15 years have I had somebody come up to you and say, Pastor, I need help. I need, I need you to pray with me. I, I've been struggling. You know, I, I've, I've been going to Givers Anonymous, and, and I'm just, I'm struggling because uh, I'm just being tempted uh, to, to give, and, and I need you to pray for me. I've been fasting and praying. I don't know. I've been tempted. No, temptation is about you, you doing what's wrong. And so what you see people struggling with is not the temptation to give, but the temptation to do what? To keep it, to hold on. And so actually, you know, we're going to get into this next week. Actually, you find out that, that poverty is not really about the money that you have. It's about the, the, the money you've been holding on to. It's not about the money you don't have. It's about the money that you won't let go of. I'm telling you, that's something good right there. You better write that down. Poverty is not about money that you don't have. It's about money you shouldn't have, that you've been holding on to. And yet, if you, if you keep things in context to what God has told us and Jesus has told us and the Apostle Paul told us, it's not God wanting you to get rid of it just so you don't have anything. He's trying to get you to get rid of it so he can get stuff to you. He's wanting you to be a conduit, to be a channel for his riches to funnel this thing into the world and to the church. That's why a part of our confession is... You know, so I can have plenty and more to put in store so I can be what? A major blessing, not just so I can have stuff. Stuff is great. Nothing wrong with stuff. 
but, but you need to be a channel. You need to be a conduit. And that's why, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, I, I am endeavoring to be rich. I am rich in Christ. Why? Because when your perspective is right, that you're rich so you can be a blessing. You know, in 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18, if you read 18, that's why Paul, go, or Paul goes on and tells Timothy to tell them, don't trust in uncertain riches, trust in the living God who gives you all things richly to enjoy. And he said, make sure and tell them to be rich in good works. I don't understand people in this world, especially Christians, especially spirit-filled, charismatic folks that have a problem with us people, Christians, having money. Because you can't be rich in good works if you're not rich in stuff. Makes absolutely no sense. It boggles my mind how we're supposed to be a blessing to people and do it broke. It's not possible. And the same people are preaching that. They're still asking people to give to the building fund. They're still taking up tithes and offerings every week. But God wants you broke, but we want you to give. <laughs> Something's going on. Because if you just read your Bible, you won't be stupid no more. You won't be ignorant no more. It's so simple. You just read what God said. You read what Jesus said and you keep it in context and you read not to go in there to try to prove a point. You read, just read what he said. And it's so simple. If you'll give, it'll be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. God, who gives you richly all things to enjoy, I just don't want you to trust in the things. But hey, you can enjoy them. You can enjoy them. So ultimately it comes down to this, where your treasure is, where your money is going, the money trail that's going to determine where your heart is at. And so it's just a thing for you to examine your heart. If you say, I love God, then you've got to ask yourself, but am I a giver? Because if you're not a giver, then let's be honest, you're really not a lover. You can't say, I love God and I honor God if I'm not a giver toward God. It's just plain and simple. It's not to step on anybody's toes. It's not to get you mad. I mean, we, we do that plenty of good all by our own. It's not to get you mad. It's just the Bible. That's what Jesus said. But ultimately, you, you see it. He's telling you these, these, these things because he's trying to get stuff to you. He's trying to get stuff to you. That's simple, huh? ABC, Sesame Street, like one, two, three. So say this with me. Say, I love God. Therefore, I'm a giver to God. Because I can't love God without my money going to God. So when I say I love God, I'm going to show God my money. <laughs>